So this morning we're finishing up our uh, series called The Prayers of Jesus. There's 25 prayers uh, that we found that Jesus prayed in the New Testament. We looked at five of them. Uh, the last one we'll be looking at uh, this morning. So last week um, we looked at humanity at his absolute worst, and we looked at God at his uh, absolute best. You know, Jesus had uh, taken the beating of his life. They had mocked him belittled him, turned on him, and um, Jesus spoke those words, uh, Father, uh, forgive them, because uh, they don't know what they're doing. If uh, forgiveness is something you deal with and you weren't here last week, whether it's receiving forgiveness uh, from God or giving that forgiveness to others, I encourage you to go back and take a listen, or you can watch that message uh, online. Forgiveness is uh, the central theme of the gospel, and um, it's something that you know, many of us deal with, so we can take a look at that. Now, we're going to continue this morning with uh, Luke chapter, uh, I'm sorry, this is from the Gospel of John, chapter 19, verse uh, 28. Um, here, uh, Jesus knew that his mission was now finished, and to fulfill the scripture, he said, uh, I am thirsty. So here, Jesus was very near at the end of his life, probably within minutes. Um, you know, so who, who knows what was going on through his mind, but we do know that there was, at this point, um, one prophecy from the Old Testament that had not been fulfilled, and that was that they would, um, that they would give uh, Jesus vinegar um, to drink. So when Jesus said, um, I am thirsty, um, Usually in this like Middle Eastern context, we can almost you know be assured that he was asking for water. Um, now remember, they put that little hat on Jesus and said, you know, here he is, the King of the Jews. Um, you know, they said, oh yeah, if you're the if you're the Son of God, you know, save yourself. I mean, they've mocked him, they've belittled him up to this point, and they were going to do it one more time. You know, so uh, we pick this up. Um, in John chapter 19, verse uh, 29, a jar of sour wine was uh, sitting there. So they soaked a sponge in it, put it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. So this is just one more uh, humiliation. It's one more act of violence. You know, instead of giving the guy some water, um, they might have just given him a little bit of relief. They uh, take this branch and they have this little sponge and they lift it up to him and they put it on his lips. Um, you know, this sour vinegar just giving him a little bit more emotional, uh, a little bit more uh, physical pain. Um, now, as brutal as that is, uh, as disheartening it is to read something like that, um, verse 30 has some of the coolest, most prolific, most powerful, most prophetic words uh, that we're going to find in the New Testament. Um, when Jesus had tasted it, he said, it is finished. Um, he said, it is finished. Now, what he's really saying is, okay, the final prophecy uh, has been fulfilled. Um, you know, the marathon is now complete. The, the fight is now over. Now, it would have been really interesting to be there that day to know how Jesus said this. So, you know, did he stumble across uh, the finish line like a tired marathon runner saying, like, it is finished? Or was it like this moment of adrenaline, like this powerful moment where it says, it is finished? You know, we, 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 we just, we don't know. Um, but he's saying, like, it's done. Everything, Dad, that you sent me to do... I have done it. It is finished. Now, the Bible goes on to say in uh, John chapter uh, 19, verse 30. Now, listen to what happened next. And then he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. You know, so that was uh, the moment that Jesus died. Now, in the Greek, um, the word, uh, it is finished, Greek and English are structured in two different ways, so it's just one word. Um, it is finished in English. In Greek, it's, the word is uh, tetelestai. Now, the way that you know, this would be translated would be like, um, I did it, um, I paid the debt, it's finished. So I looked at different ways the word tetelestai was uh, used uh, this week, and 
you know, thousands of years ago when a, a servant would have returned um, to his master and did and completed everything the master asked him to do, um, he would have greeted the master by saying, Ted Lestai, you know, I've done what you've asked me to do. Another way uh, it was used in the, uh, you know, a couple thousand years ago was like if uh, a merchant um, you know, was dealing with uh, you know, one of his customers or her customers and they paid in full, you know, what uh, the word there would be is Ted Lestai. You know, you, you've, you've paid your debt uh, in full. And the last way that would be used is when a, a priest would be examining um, a baby lamb, like, you know, to be sacrificed. And the priest would look, and if it was the perfect lamb, if it was worthy to be sacrificed, the priest would look at the lamb and the priest would say, Ted Lestai. You know, so when uh, Jesus says that word, it has... Uh, you know, all these, uh, you know, significant meanings. And, and Jesus is saying, I did it. History from this day is going to be forever changed. You know, my work here is, is, is complete. So as we look at this text, like, we know that Jesus, he finished strong. You know, I've dealt with people in the last hours of their life, in the last minutes of their life, and the last days and months and, and years of their life. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I'll talk to the people, and, like, there's just a lot of regret. You know, someone will say something like, only if I would have, um, or if I would not have done this, then maybe things would have turned out different. You know, when Jesus said, Ted Lestai, there was, there was no regrets. Um, he did everything that he was sent here to do. Now, as I look out at us, um, I think it would be really cool, I think it would be amazing if we could start today, um, know that today's the first day of the rest of our life, and we say what we're going to do is we're going to finish strong. Um, you know, we're we're going to be able to say at the end, uh, Ted Lestai. Um, I believe that if you were sitting here today, um, I believe that there is still unfinished business that God has in your life. I believe that God is not through with you yet. I believe that there's more that God wants to do in you, and I believe that there's more that God wants to do uh, through you. So let's go to Revelation chapter 3. Uh, we're going to look at verses 1 and 2. Um, now what I want you to do is you read the scripture along with me. Um, I want this scripture to really sink into your spirit. And I, I really hope, I really hope that for some of us, the scripture uh, disturbs us a little bit. I hope it challenges us. I hope it... Um, moves us uh, to new levels of life. So here we find uh, the Bible saying, I know your deeds. Uh, you have a reputation for being alive, but, but you're dead. Wake up. Strengthen what remains um, and is about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete uh, in the sight of my God. Now, I think this text can hit most of us because we know that God is not through with, with us yet. We know that um, you know, we're not done. You know, as I read this text, it challenges me. You know, I, I read the text, and uh, it, it says, I know your deeds, you have a reputation for being alive. Yeah, that one describes me. Um, but you're dead, wake up. And, you know, sometimes I wish I was on the inside, um, you know, totally, all the time, 100%, uh, who I project that I am. You know, but like many of us, you know, there is a little bit of a disconnect. You know, sometimes, you know, we might have some doubt. Sometimes we might have some fear. Sometimes we wish we had a little bit more integrity. Sometimes, you know, we would wish that we would always do the right thing and never the easy thing. You know, as I look at my life, that's some of the unfinished business that I have. Now, maybe some of you are thinking, you know, Craig, that's me too. Maybe some of you, you know, Craig, I got that one covered, but I would still say that you have unfinished business. Now, let me ask you a question, okay? It's a question that I just want you to reflect on, you, yourself, nobody else. Um, if I were to ask you the question, um, what is your unfinished business? You know, what's, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? See, I think the first thing that comes to your mind is uh, God nudging you that, yeah, there is some unfinished business. You know, whether it's interior, internal stuff that you have to work on or exterior stuff or whatever, um, we all have unfinished business. Um, you know, let's go back a week. Let's go back seven days. Maybe, 
God is calling you to forgive somebody. Maybe God is calling you to accept uh, his forgiveness on a, on a deeper, more profound level. Maybe that's your unfinished business. You know, maybe your unfinished business is to uh, get out of debt. You know, you're, you're a slave to the debt. And maybe, you know, it's to simplify things and, and uh, you know, just be free from the debt that shackles you. Maybe your unfinished business is to share Christ with someone um, that you know is far from him, someone who's going through a difficult time, someone, uh, you know, that's just struggling. Maybe that's your unfinished business. Maybe your unfinished business is just doing whatever you can do to make one of your human interpersonal relationships better. You can't control what the other person does or doesn't do, but you can control what you do. You know, maybe your unfinished business is to listen, listen and have patience and, and show grace and, and, and seek understanding. Every single day is another opportunity for you to take one step closer to the purposes and plans that God has for you. You see, what Jesus did is he finished strong. He finished well. He gave it everything he had. There was absolutely no regrets when he spoke that word, tetelestai. So, what is it that we can do to finish well? Well, I just have a couple things. One of them, um, you're going to see on the screen behind me, is uh, we're going to have to make a commitment. Now, some of you are thinking, gee, Craig, I never thought of that one. Um, thanks for that just uh, powerful bit of revelation that you just spoke to all of us. Um, that right there is going to change the world. Man, you, you're brilliant. Um, give me point two and let's wrap this thing up and get out to the ground and have a party. You know, I make commitments on the first of every year, and uh, by the 8th, it's not so good that I make a commitment on my birthday that this is going to be the best year, and then it's not the best year, and I'm going to make it again. And I'm back to the point where I'll start every Monday with this new commitment, and <laughs> it lasts like seven days. It doesn't even last that long. It lasts like two days, and I make it again just because I like Mondays. And So uh, the problem is, though, we have a diminished uh, view of what commitment actually is. Um, you know, so let's go to 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 11. Now here Paul says, now, now, now finish the work. Okay, so think about commitment. Now finish the work so that your eager willingness to do it may be matched by your completion of it. Now our culture totally embraces and gets like this eager willingness thing, but that is not commitment. The will to win means absolutely nothing without the will to prepare to win. Seriously, someone like take out your phone and tweet that. I'll say it again. Um, <laughs> the will to win means nothing without the will to prepare to win. Um, thank you. Um, it's like I'm back in the South. So uh, let's go back to... Um, 1519, there was a man uh, who was named Horatio Cortez. Uh, he was uh, from Spain. The governor of Spain gave him uh, permission, gave him um, 11 boats and 700 men, and they were going to go to uh, what's now like Central America, um, and they're going to like take the land. They're going to take the treasures. Uh, they're going to come back with, with all this great news, and they were all so excited about it. They had the eager willingness Okay, so they took the long trip across the ocean. It wasn't quite as glamorous as they thought. But they got to the land, and, you know, there's all these natives that weren't just going to give up these treasures in this land. You know, shortly after this, like, they had lost their eager willingness. You know, they got together. They complained, like, can we go back to Spain? Like, this seemed like a good idea at the time, like all these treasures and all this land, but can we get back on these boats and go back to Spain? So do you know what he did? Um, do you know what uh, uh, Horatio, uh, what he, what he, Her Hernando Cortez, do you know what he did? He, he burned the ships. He's like, we're not going anywhere. We came here to do something, and we're going to finish it. Now, here's the deal. Like, that's commitment. Your commitment is, is taking your passionate desire. Commitment is drawing a line in the sand. Commitment is putting a stake in the ground. It is crossing that line and to say turning back is not an option. 
I have unfinished business, and it's time for me to burn the boats because there is no way back. I'm going to complete this until it's finished. You know, that's how we finish strong. Like, that's how we commit with that type of resolve. Now, we see this personified in the person of Jesus. Now, Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane. We find this in Luke chapter uh, 22. Now, Jesus knew uh, the Hebrew Scriptures. He knew the Old Testament. He, he knew the prophecies. He knew the journey that was right in front of him. This involved uh, emotional pain. Uh, it involved uh, relational humiliation. It involved like this excruciating um, physical trauma. Like he knew what was in front of him. You know, so he's in his quiet place and he's talking to God. And here's what he says in verse uh, 42. Father, if you are willing, please take this cup of suffering from me. He's like saying, Dad, if there's any other way. Um, yeah, I, I know that this is good. I know that this is right, but I don't want this. You know, can you take this away from me? So commitment, and Jesus knew what commitment was. Commitment is taking your passion, desire, and doing something. It is drawing a line in the sand and putting a stake in the ground. It is crossing that line and saying, I'm never going back. So Jesus concludes this short prayer in verse 42. Like this is part of the Lord's prayer as well. Um, we pray it every Sunday. What do we say? Thy kingdom come, thy, thy will be done. Jesus says, yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Now at that moment in Gethsemane, and he would eventually take this journey to Golgotha, um, it was on. You know, Jesus, he, he was committed to finishing strong. The boat had been burned. The line had been put in the sand. The stake had been put in the ground. And Jesus was moving forward, not coming back. Now, the next thing, and the this, this second is the final step, but you'll have to repeat this step many times. Um, number two is just take the next step. Like, start where you are. That's the only place uh, that you can begin. Not where you used to be, not where you want to be, but, but where you are. Um, so go back to that thing you were thinking about a little bit ago, that unfinished business. Um, I had a couple people after the first service come up and say, I had a lot of unfinished business. Just pick one of them. Just pick one of them and ask yourself, what is the next step that you can take today? What is the next step that you can take uh, uh, this week? You know, and, and here's why we do this, because there's a chasm between who we are and where we are and who God wants us to be and what God wants us to do. Like, we all have this gap. And what happens is when we take the next step, the gap gets a little bit smaller. And the next step after that makes the gap a little bit smaller. In a series of next step, you know, we get to this, this little divide, and that's really cool. Then when there's no divide at all, and, and we can say tetelestai, and it's completed, this is amazing. When who we are and what we're doing is exactly who God wants us to be, and we do exactly what God wants us to do. Now, many people don't finish. We don't even bother to start because, like, we're way over here and we know that we should be way over here and we're thinking, how in the world can we pull this off? Well, the way you do this is through a series of next steps. One step at a time. Like Bill Murray, do you remember, like, what kind of step did he take? Baby steps, right? So you take a baby step to the elevator, you can do this. Um, I know there's some people today that need to take a baby step, um, in overcoming an addiction. Maybe there's like some type of uh, filter that you need to put on your computer. Maybe there's some type of accountability where you say, I'm not going to go to that place on Friday or Saturday night. It's a baby step. You know, it's a baby step that we're going to have to take if we truly want to get out of debt and experience that freedom in that part of our life. Maybe the baby step is to say, I'm going to ask myself, how is it that I can live more simply um, you know, this week. You know, baby steps to become more forgiving. Um, baby steps for a, a better relationship. I'm going to listen. I'm not going to talk this week. I'm just going to listen. I'm going to try to understand the other person. 
Now, um, let's go to Psalm uh, 119, verse uh, 105. Here the Bible says that your word is a lamp to guide my feet and a light for my path. Um, now, the next step does not mean that you even see the destination. Yeah, I think it was Martin Luther King that described faith as like taking the next step, even though you don't see the end of the staircase. You know, so there's many of us that we know these next steps, and we'll take these next steps, and we'll take these next steps uh, in faith, believing that God will close the gap between who we currently are and what we're currently doing and who he wants us to become and what he wants us to do. Now, let's think about um, Jesus. Like, he was familiar um, with the next step. Yeah, I think the next step for some of you is like write a letter, make a phone call, send a text, cut up a credit card, create, uh, update your resume, forgive somebody, surrender fully to Christ. I think that's probably many of our next steps. But let's look at the steps that Jesus took on this journey from Gethsemane to Golgotha. Um, You know, there's a time that they came and they took these thorns and they made a crown and they slammed it on his head. You know, a sudden blood covered his face, and what did Jesus have to do when he took the next step? You know, it was then when they took this leather whip and they uh, hit him 39 times. Each time, he knew where he had to go, so he took another step. You know, they uh, gave him this beam of wood, and he had to carry it up this hill. Um, It got heavy. He was in pain. But he knew what his mission was. So he took another step. You know, the people, they uh, made fun of him. They crucify him. I don't know him. So Jesus, he took another step. He got to the top, and he saw these great big nails. They actually looked like railroad spikes. They, you know, hammered them through his hands and his feet. Um, Jesus, he hung on the cross, and he took the last step. You know, eventually he said that word, tetelestai. You know, and what Jesus did for all of us, um, you know, it wasn't like an instant gratification type thing. It was a series of next steps where he could look at God and he could say that short little prayer, tetelestai, it is finished. Let's go to uh, Philippians chapter 1, verse 6. Um, And if you still have air in your lungs, if you are capable of breathing, you have not yet finished what God has purposed you to complete. So Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, Paul says, And I am certain that God, who began the good work within you, so if you're trying to forgive, if you're trying to get out of debt, um, if you're trying to grow closer to God, if you're trying to relate better to somebody, um, God has already started this good work in you. He will continue his work until it is finally finished on that day when Christ Jesus returns. I want to talk to, like, the kids for a second. If you're, like, middle school, high school, I don't suspect there's too many high schoolers here. They had prom last night. Um, But uh, college age, your 20s, I I think one of the things I want you to hear, the thing I want you to hear this morning is one of the most uh, important things you're going to learn in life is this thing called uh, delayed gratification. Like we live in this culture of uh, instant gratification. Delayed gratification says, I'm going to have the patience to take a series of next steps. I'm going to build like this really rock-solid foundation so that this huge skyscraper can be built. Now, building a foundation is not fun. You know, it's not glamorous, but it's absolutely necessary. Jesus says that when we uh, uh, build our lives on the, on the foundation that is him, when, not if, but when, you know, the rains come and the winds blow, we will not be moved because we are rooted in his grace, in his love. There's not a single one of us in here this morning that is entitled to a darn thing. You know, your life, um, you know, we're going to say no to some lesser things so that we can say yes uh, to better things. Um, let's, let's use the church as an example because many of you have seen this unfold over the last decade. Some of you, it's been the last couple years. Some of you, it's been the last couple weeks. 
But I'm just going to give this as an example of um, committed people taking the next step. You know, so we actually started a small group over 11 years ago. You know, we uh, collected a leadership team. Um, it took us a year to launch a worship service at uh, Russell Middle School. You know, one of the cool things early on for me as a pastor um, was seeing a bunch of people take the next step. Like, you know, I'm going to own this church. Uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be an investor. I'm going to serve. I'm going to give. And we saw people do that. You know, we grew so much the first year that we had to move from Russell to uh, here. Now, um, we did some crazy things. We used to, like, give out free car washes and, like, stand on the corners and give out newspapers and, um, you know, just do... We collect, we've collected over 125,000 pounds of food by standing in front of grocery stores. Um, every single one of those things was the next step. If someone would have told me that it was going to take 11 or 12 years to get to the place where we're going to have a groundbreaking, um, if the bishop would have told me I was to send me somewhere else, that's too much, it's too long. But you know, I'll tell you what, it's been the coolest thing I've ever experienced. You know, just a bunch of people taking the next step. You know, we started a second worship service here um, in 2012, the Water's Edge and our parent church, Faith Westwood, we uh, decided to become two different congregations. Um, they were such a blessing. They helped us get to that point. In 2012, we had to set up financial systems. We had to set up information systems. Um, we had to set up new leadership systems. I remember the first year, like, uh, you know, we started off with this much money, and then, like, it just kept going like that, and, like, <clears throat> my sleep kept going like that, too, and then, like, y'all became owners and generous givers, and since that day, like, it's been like that, and it's just been amazing to see a bunch of people just take the next step. You know, so we had a campaign where we raised $1.25 million for the 23.3 acres that our church is going to be sitting on. You know, you're going to see that church start to uh, uh, raise in the next month or so. Um, you know, we bought a ministry center. We raised $125,000 in one day. We, uh, I remember one time I came up here with this really harebrained idea, like this guy from Release Ministries called me up and said, we need a van. I said, oh, don't worry, we'll take care of it. Um, then I like, came up to the phone, I said, what did I just agree to? And like I <clears throat> came here one Sunday morning and y'all bought a van for Release Ministries. They still use it. Um, you know, we started partnerships in Uganda and, and, and Belize and you know, we uh, have invested uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars in our students yeah, one of the really cool things you guys do, you just give every chance. You, you just take the next step. You, ta you take the, I mean, we uh, give to the Millard Business Association, like, you know, so all the kids in the Millard School District can get uh, Christmas presents. And y'all give more presents than all churches and all businesses combined. I mean, you take the next step. Now, um, last year we raised $2.4 million for a new building, and that's the down payment, and and we have worked for years. We have worked over a decade of, of, of ordinary people through an amazing God taking the next step. So I want us to show a little bit of a video about our history. And as you watch this, I just want you to think these are a bunch of people just taking the next step. Come and listen. Come to the water's edge of you. Know and fear the Lord Come and listen Come to the water's edge Are you Who are thirsty Come Let me tell you What he Has done for me let me tell you what he has done for me. He has done for you. He has done for us. Come and listen. Come and listen to what he's done. Come and listen.
done for you. He has done for us. Come and listen. Come and listen to what He's done. Come and listen. Come and. So as we go out to uh, 19600 Harrison Street, that's going to be our new address. Um, I hope this is like deeply like a significant spiritual experience for you. And you know, it's not because we're breaking ground. Um, the reason why is because what I want you to remember is you, you know, drive out to that place, or even if you pass it, if you're not going out by there, every time you pass that, what I want you to remember um, is this is just a bunch of ordinary people taking the next step over and over again, utilizing the resources, the grace, the love, the power of an extraordinary God. And remember, if God can use us to pull that off, there is absolutely nothing that God can't do in your life when you commit to just taking the next step over and over until where you are now and who you are now moves in completely to Christ-likeness so that you're the person that he wants you to be and that you're doing the things that he wants you to do. I want you to remember that every time you go by that property. Yeah, that's what's going on here, so let's pray. Lord, uh, we just come to you and it's Palm Sunday, God, and you have uh, entered into Jerusalem, and God, now we ask that you uh, enter into uh, to our hearts. Lord, enter into our minds, enter into our persona, God, that we will just commit, that we will burn the ships, that we'll put a stake in the ground, that we'll put a lie in the sand, um, that we're not turning back. We're moving forward. So, Lord, I uh, uh, just pray, God, that um, we can pray that will, Lord, not, not my will, but your will be done. So, Lord, together now in one voice, we come and we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.